Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait a minute or two for more people to log in, and then we'll be starting the program. We'll just give it one more minute before we start. Okay, I think we're going to get started now. Welcome to today's webinar, Radiation and Uterine Cancer, What You Need to Know. I'm Kitty Silverman, and I'm the Uterine Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been helping people through breast, ovarian, uterine, or metastatic breast cancer for the last 44 years by offering the support of those who have been there. SHARE provides many services, including a helpline, support groups, and educational programs. All services are free of charge to participants. For more information, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. Gupta has finished presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the question pane in the control panel on your screen. When asking questions, remember that the presenter is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Vishal Gupta is an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City and is the director of radiation oncology at the Blavatnik Family Chelsea Medical Center. His practice focuses on the management of gynecologic malignancies. In addition to treating patients, he is actively involved in research projects. Dr. Gupta's research has been published in major cancer journals and has been presented at international meetings. Welcome, Dr. Gupta, and I will turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to give this important talk. Um, I'm hoping to... Uh, let the audience know a little bit more about radiation treatment for uterine cancer um, and hopefully uh, answer some questions that I know have already been given. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes uh, with slides and then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. I'm going to stop sharing the webcam uh, just so that I don't look at myself talking during this whole time, but I'll open it up, uh, bring that camera back up uh, for the Q&A session. So um, the title talk the title of the talk is radiation and uterine cancer what you need to know. Um, as they mentioned, uh, I'm a radiation oncologist at Mount Sinai in New York City, and I specialize in the management of gynecologic cancers. So the objectives uh, of this talk and the outline are I'm going to provide some background on endometrial cancers in the anatomy. I'll talk about treatment options for endometrial cancer and specifically focus on the radiation treatment and its side effects. Just to make sure everyone understands the anatomy that we're going to be talking about. Um, so the uterus sits in the pelvis of the female. Um, at the bottom part of the uterus is the cervix and below that is the vagina. Just next to the uterus is something called the broad ligament, which is also known as the parametrium. Um, on either side of the uterus are the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. Just so everyone is clear, the cancers of the uterus, a majority of them start on the inner lining of the uterus called the endometrium. You can maybe see this white thin line right here. That's called the endometrial lining, and that's where a majority of the cancers start. They will then grow outwards 
through this muscle of the uterus. Um, and that is a very important part of the staging of uterine cancers and how we manage them. How much growth happens from the endometrial lining into the muscle of the uterine wall. Um, occasionally they will grow into the cervix, sometimes into the parametrium or bra ligament or along the fallopian tubes and ovaries. But this thickness of the wall uh, that's involved is very important. Also what's important are pelvic lymph nodes that surround the uterus. Pelvic lymph nodes, uh, so lymph nodes in general, are typically a way for uh, our bodies to help fight infections. Um, and so they're usually a good thing, but in some situations there are, uh, it, it's a way for cancers to spread as well. So the cancers can go from the uterus into the lymph nodes. So we have to know where the lymph nodes are. Um, and again, this affects staging and treatment options. So knowing that the uterus is surrounded by many lymph nodes is an important point. This diagram on the right shows how the uterus sits in the body in relation to other nearby structures. You can see the uterus is here in red and it usually flops on top of the bladder, which is in front. Um, sorry, let me just back up to orient you. Uh, so this is the tummy right here. This is the back side. This is a side view into the body. And so the bladder sits in front of the uterus, and here is the vagina here. You can see how close the vagina is to the urethra. And then on the backside, you can see the rectum is on the backside of the uterus. So this was really important for the treatment options and potentially side effects from radiation treatment, realizing how close these structures are to each other. So endometrial cancer is the most common gynecologic malignancy in the, in the U.S. There are about 65,000 cases diagnosed annually and about 12,000 deaths from endometrial cancer yearly. It's becoming increasingly common due to obesity and fewer children. Um, the main risk factors for endometrial cancer are increased estrogen, which is, obesity is part of. The more obese someone is, the more fat tissue they have, and estrogen is produced in this fatty tissue. And so because you have increased estrogen, there's an increased risk of endometrial cancer. Chronic anovulation, uh, early menarche, late menopause, and not having children are all risk factors for endometrial cancer. Um, and Lynch syndrome is a genetic hereditary uh, risk factor for endometrial cancer as well. Patients with uh, endometrial cancer often present to their doctors with postmenopausal bleeding. That is by far the most common symptom that patients have uh, before their diagnosis. Uh, more advanced cases, you can see pelvic pain, and then all, uh, occasionally, if the cervix is involved, you can have an abnormal pap smear. But typically, pap smears are there to detect cervix cancers, not endometrial cancers. So we can move on to treatment options, uh, which include surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Um, I just want to take a step back and just talk about the history of cancer treatment. Some people aren't aware of how um, old radiation treatment is. Uh, so the first cancer treatment was surgery. There's evidence of Egyptians doing breast cancer surgeries more than 5,000 years ago. So by far, surgery is the oldest modality uh, that we have to treat cancer. Um, and then around 1895, about 120 years ago, William Rankin discovered x-rays. This is actually a picture of the first x-ray ever taken. It was his wife's hand, and you can see the nice big rock she has on her finger. Um, no, it's not a diamond, but uh, it, it is an x-ray of her hand, and that was the first time the x-rays were discovered. Um, and then shortly after that, a medical student in Chicago decided to use these x-rays as a way to treat cancer. He was a medical student and then opened up a radiation treatment facility um, in Chicago. Um, you know, obviously nothing that would be done today, but he did find some early responses to breast cancer um, with this treatment. So radiation has been around for about 120 years. Um, and these are actually Emil Grubé's hands. Uh, you can see he's had some amputations and lost some fingers because he was actually holding the radiation in his hands because he didn't know about the side effects of radiation at the time. But uh, it was one of the first um, uh, side effects known was that if you handle radiation, bad things can happen. So we don't handle radiation in that way anymore. It wasn't until about 40 or 50 years later that chemotherapy was invented um, or you know, somewhat discovered. Nitrogen mustards were initially used uh, in the First and Second World War as chemical warfare, and they used to spray these over the battlefields to kind of uh, incapacitate soldiers. When these soldiers went to the infirmaries and were uh, you know, 
attended to, they checked their blood levels and found that their blood levels had dropped very low. And so researchers at Yale said, well, if they can take a normal person's blood values and drop them to low, what if someone who has increased blood values abnormally, such as leukemia and lymphoma, what if we gave them these same chemicals, would it drop their blood counts into normal levels? And it found that it did. Uh, here you see a soldier with these painful blisters all throughout, because as he had been, uh, um, you know, uh, been in war and uh, these nitrogen mustard gases were essentially sprayed on the field. So you can see uh, very uncomfortable, but this is essentially the development of chemotherapy. So it was in the 1940s. So I just wanted to emphasize that radiation treatment is older than chemotherapy because I have a lot of patients that come up to me and who think that radiation is a new thing and it's experimental, but it's actually been around longer than chemotherapy. As far as cancer treatment goes, so the goal of surgery is to typically to remove all of the tumor. In some cases, they will remove just a portion of the tumor. Surgery is typically done to cure somebody. Once in a while, surgery is done to palliate somebody. Palliate means that the cancer is technically incurable and where the palliation is just to get improve their symptoms or side effects. Radiation treatment kills the tumor cells. It doesn't get rid of the organ itself. Um, it's uh, can be usually done curatively, but we also certainly do palliative radiation treatment for pain or for bleeding tumors. Uh, chemotherapy also kills tumor cells in a similar fashion as radiation does. It's typically used in conjunction with surgery and or radiation in the curative setting. This next point is something that surprises a lot of people in that chemotherapy rarely cures cancer on its own. The exceptions are what I mentioned before, leukemia and lymphoma, but chemotherapy is not on itself, not in itself a curative treatment. Um, it, it's usually used with surgery or radiation to cure patients. It is, however, the primary treatment in the metastatic setting. Once the cancer has spread, chemotherapy is typically the main uh, treatment option since it can go around the entire body and help control the cancer that way. So let's go back to endometrial cancer. Hysterectomy is typically the first step in endometrial cancer. There are five different types of hysterectomies and they're typically based on the extent of the surgery. Type one removes the uterus and cervix only and it's really the most common type of uh, hysterectomy done on uh, free, free endometrial cancer. Type five is a much more extensive surgery. It removes not only the uterus and cervix but also removes most of the vagina, the bladder and the rectum. Fortunately, we don't need to do type five surgeries very much anymore, but uh, type one is typically what's done for endometrial cancer. I just wanted to mention some of the side effects from surgery because sometimes patients get confused with what may be a side effect from surgery and what may be a side effect from chemo or radiation if that's needed after. Patients can have pelvic pain from the surgery that may require uh, medications. Patients can have um, ileus, which is uh, a bowel uh, essentially stops working, so we uh, these are managed fairly conservatively without surgery. Patients can have urinary retention or leakage after surgery, wound complications, nerve damage, surgical menopause, uh, and then lymphedema, which is swelling of the legs, uh, which is uncommonly seen but possible. So once we have the surgery, the uterus is then sent to the pathologist who reviews uh, the specimen under a microscope, and we come up with the stage of the cancer. So endometrial cancer is one of the few cancers in the body where we actually need to do the surgery first before we can really appropriately stage the patient. This is different than uh, other cancers. Stage one uh, endometrial cancers are uh, tumors that are limited to the uterus. Less than 50% myometrial invasion is considered a 1A, and more than 50% is considered 1B. This goes back to the anatomy slide uh, I was talking about earlier, where we look at how deep into the muscle is the, endo is the cancer. I mentioned that the cancer usually starts on this inner lining and grows in. So here you have an example of a stage 1A patient with less than 50% invasion, and here's a station of patient with 1B, which is more extensive. This delineation between 1A and 1B is extremely important because it could be the, could mean the difference between do you need further treatment after surgery or not. So this distinction, distinction is very important. Stage two patients are one, those uh, cancers are those that involve the cervix, which is the structure down below. Stage three is when the tumor has gone outside of the uterus, but remains within the pelvis. So pelvic lymph nodes is the most common type of stage three uh, and 
those lymph nodes would be located next to the uterus. Um, so that's a stage three situation. Stage four is when you have an extensive tumor that's grown into the bladder or into the rectum or potentially even distant metastases uh, to the lungs or bones. So overall survival by stage of endometrial cancers, uh, stage one patients uh, have about 85% survival, stage two a little bit lower, and then stage three and four you can see aren't as good. Um, but there are still some long-term survivors in these stage four A patients, which means it's into the bladder or rectum. As chemotherapy and immunotherapy have gotten better over the years, hopefully we can improve some of these numbers in these patients who are uh, at more advanced stages. So the treatment after surgery, so as I mentioned, surgery is the first step always in endometrial cancer. The, whether a patient needs treatment after surgery or not depends on the pathology report and other risk factors. Fortunately, most women do not need any further treatment after surgery, and that's the only treatment they need. However, we look at some risk factors, such as the type of uterine cancer that they have. Adenocarcinoma is the most common, and luckily, it is also the least aggressive of them. There are other types of uterine cancer, such as papillary serous carcinoma and clear cell carcinoma. Those are much more rare, but we do see those. Uh, the stage of the cancer matters, the grade, uh, the cancer is graded from one, two, or three. Three is the most aggressive type of uh, cancer, and one is the least aggressive. Lymphovascular invasion is something we assess. The lymphovascular spaces is essentially the highways to the lymph nodes. I mentioned that there are um, lymph nodes adjacent to the uh, uterus, and before it gets to the lymph nodes, it has to get into these highways. And so we look to see, are the tumor cells inside those highways? We look at patient age, the older patients are, they tend to have more aggressive cancer, so that also comes into um, a factor when we are trying to figure out which treatment to recommend, or if any. Based on these risk factors, patients are grouped into low, intermediate, or high risk of recurrence, um, and based on those is where we come up with our treatment algorithms. So patients who are in the low risk group, these are patients who have, uh, I'm not gonna go into the exact uh, groupings. It's very complicated, um, and so I just would, um, you know, it's a discussion I think you can have with your doctors about which group you may fit into. Uh, it, it's fairly complicated, uh, including all of these factors. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go uh, pass over that a little bit because it's a little bit controversial in different parts of the world use different strategies to group these patients. But in general, low risk patients are those that have a less than 5% risk after surgery alone and no further treatment is needed. As I mentioned, this is the majority of women with endometrial cancer. So about 70% or so of women who have endometrial cancer fall into the low risk group. They have a hysterectomy and they need no further treatment and their cancer will never be a problem for them in the rest of their lives. The intermediate risk group, these are patients who have about a 10 to 25% risk of recurrence after surgery alone. Radiation may be recommended to reduce this risk of recurrence. The vaginal cuff, and I'll get to that in a second, what that is exactly, um, is the most likely site for recurrence. Radiation after surgery improves the risk of recurrence uh, to 3 to 15%. So, you know, instead of it being about 10 to 25, it goes down to 3 to 15 percent after radiation. So radiation by no means guarantees you that there's no risk of recurrence, but it certainly reduces it significantly. The studies that have been done have not shown that radiation improves survival. What this means is that the radi uh, if you had surgery and you uh, were in this intermediate risk category and you decided not to have radiation for whatever reason, excuse me, one second, I need to call you back. Um, sorry about that. Um, the, uh, if you decided not to have surge, uh, radiation um, and the cancer came back, there are still some treatment options, albeit there'd be much very aggressive treatment options, but that is why the survival doesn't change if you have radiation uh, or not right after surgery, because there's a higher chance the cancer will come back, but there are still some treatment options for you if that happens. So 
to explain a little bit of the anatomy after surgery, here is again a side view of uh, the anatomy. Here is the tummy, here is the backside, um, the vagina is here, and now the cervix and uterus have been removed. They are no longer here. So th what happens is the surgeon creates this cuff of vagina right here that the suture closed during the surgery and eventually the sutures dissolve, but it's just the vagina ends up in this blind loop. This top of the vagina ends up being the most likely place for the cancers to recur uh, in stage one intermediate risk patients. So this is one of the areas that we are concerned with. And again, you can see its proximity to the bladder and the rectum. High risk patients, these are patients that have a more than 50% chance of their cancer recurring after surgery alone. The recurrence may be in uh, distant, meaning to the lungs or typically bones, um, or it can recur somewhere in the pelvis, either at the vaginal cuff or in lymph nodes. Chemotherapy is typically recommended, possibly with radiation. Chemotherapy has been shown to improve survival in these patients over no chemotherapy. Um, the radiation reduces the risk of the cancer coming back in the pelvis, and then the radiation can be given before, during, or after chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is typically a combination of carboplatin and paclitaxel. Um, it is given every three weeks for six cycles. Uh, the possible side effects of the chemotherapy, um, we see patients with neuropathy, which is a sensation of tingling and numbness in their feet and hands. And these are typically treated with, med uh, they can be treated with medications. To be honest, these medications usually aren't very effective and usually just time will help um, resolve this. Patients can get hair loss, uh, nausea, fatigue, their blood counts can be lowered, and they can have decreased appetite. And I just put some treatment options on the side here just in case uh, anyone was curious. All right, so now I'm going to dig into radiation treatment in a little bit more detail. Um, so there are different types of radiation treatment. Uh, teletherapy is the most common way we deliver radiation treatment. It's also known as external beam radiotherapy. The prefix tele means distant, so the radiation treatment is given from outside the body, from a distance. Um, this is usually done with a machine called a linear accelerator. Uh, this is a picture of the first linear accelerator ever developed in, at Stanford in the 1950s, I believe. This is the first patient ever treated with a linear accelerator. This is a four-year-old boy who had cancers in his bilateral eyes called retinoblastoma. His right eye has already been removed. This is a glass eye that he has. The left eye also had cancer in it, and they did not, they did not want to remove that because then obviously he'd be blind. So they uh, decided decided to use this linear accelerator to treat his left eye, and it was actually a very successful treatment. And since this was in the 1950s, this patient's actually still alive and lives in the Bay Area, and he has, uh, he's cancer-free, and he has vision in that left eye. So that was a happy ending to that story because I probably wouldn't have a job if that <laughs> didn't end so well. Um, but uh, this is a picture of the modern day linear accelerator. Um, you can see it looks very similar to the older, you know, the initial one, but a lot more bells and whistles these days. You may have heard of some other uh, radiation treatments. I just wanted to touch on them briefly because they are advertised heavily and I get some questions from patients. There's something called a cyber knife, uh, which is not used in gynecologic cancers. It's a radiation that is on this uh, radiation treatment machine that's on this arm and this uh, machine can move about in multiple different directions. It can be used to treat multiple cancers throughout the body, but it's typically not used in gynecologic cancers for various reasons I'm not gonna get into. There's uh, another machine called a Gamma knife that's used to treat brain tumors only. So again, not used in GYN cancers. Um, and this is a picture of that. And then uh, more recently, people have been talking a lot about proton therapy. This is used mostly for brain tumors or in tumors close to uh, some sensitive organs, uh, not typically used in um, gynecologic cancers. Here's just a picture of what typical, if this is the brain uh, and this is the tumor, we typically the treat an area this big, but there's a lot of low dose of radiation that goes to the rest of the, the brain. When we use protons, we can really target much better. It hasn't really been shown to be effective in gynecologic cancers yet, but studies are ongoing. But we don't typically use it right now. 
Another type of radiation treatment is brachytherapy. So brachy means short, meaning the radiation travels a short distance. In this situation, we put the radiation right up against the tumor. It can be done, uh, there's something called intracavitary versus interstitial brachytherapy. Intracavitary, uh, you can use for breast cancers, cervix cancers, or endometrial cancers. Um, here are some different pictures of them. Uh, this is what I'll be talking about a little bit more. This is uh, a cylinder brachytherapy, a type of intracavitary that is used to treat um, endometrial cancers. Interstitial requires needles to be piercing through an organ. The most common type is prostate brachytherapy, where we put about 100 radioactive seeds into the prostate in men, um, not typically used for endometrial cancer, so I'm not going to talk about it much there. So endometrial cancer, the treatment options, I mentioned external beam is one of the common ways. The targets when we use external beam is the vaginal cuff, which is the remnant of the vagina after the hysterectomy. The parametrium, which is the tissue adjacent to the uterus that has not been removed. And then the pelvic lymph nodes that were not removed during surgery as well. This is a daily treatment Monday through Friday for typically five weeks. And this is usually only for high risk patients these days. Occasionally, you'll get someone who has intermediate risk features, and we offer them external beam, but typically these patients uh, who get external beam have high-risk disease. Brachytherapy is done with a cylinder. It treats only the vaginal cuff. It treats a much smaller area. It does not treat the parametrium and does not treat the pelvic lymph nodes. Uh, the vaginal cuff, as I mentioned, is the most common site of recurrence in intermediate risk patients. This is given one to two times per week for th three weeks. Um, and this is typically used for intermediate risk patients. This is a picture of the vaginal cylinder here. This tube fits into the vagina and the top of it uh, is placed right up against the vaginal cuff that we're most concerned with in those intermediate risk patients. There are different sizes of vaginal cylinders and the uh, doctors will try to figure out which size works best for patients. Um, so they usually do a, a session where they try to do a measurement to figure out which size works best. So um, as I mentioned, um, the anatomy plays a crucial role. So when we treat with external beam, uh, the uterus will be gone at that point, but this broad ligament is still there. The pelvic lymph nodes will still be there. Um, so the external beam would be focused on this area where the uterus was and where the cervix was. And uh, it'll also treat the vaginal cuff. When we use a cylinder, we put the cylinder into the vagina. It goes up against the vaginal cuff. Again, the uterus will be gone and the cervix will be gone. So really just treating the upper vagina and you'll see the bladder and the rectum are, will be in close proximity to that. The radiation dose the, that we use, the unit of measure is called gray. So in medications, we often talk in milligrams. In radiation, we talk about in gray. For brachytherapy, the total dose we give is 21 to 30 gray. There are different ways to give this. Uh, there's different physician preferences and different hospitals do different things. So I'm just kind of giving you a range here. Um, typically each treatment is four to seven gray. They can be given one or two times per week. And it's typically the whole course is three to six treatments over three weeks. This is in contrast to the external beam radiation where the dose is 45 to 50 gray. Typically, we get about two gray a day, and there are 25 daily treatments over five weeks. So 25 times two gives you that 50 gray. Um, I just wanted to show you a uh, some scans and how the radiation dose works. Um, so this is a CAT scan uh, of the pelvis. Uh, this over here is the right side. This is the left side. This is the lower tummy, and then this is the back side here. This area in red represents what would be getting the full dose of 50 gray in a patient who was getting external beam radiation. So the radiation target where we would be aiming at the top of the vagina is pretty much right here under the red lettering. But you'll see here, this is intestines and this is rectum. And if we were to go lower down on the scan, you would see the bladder. They get full dose, even though they're not intended to, they fall within the radiation target because we also have to treat lymph nodes that sit here and sit here along the bones. So in order to target the radiation to get the lymph nodes and the vaginal cuff, we have to treat with this generous radiation field. And you will see that because the radiation comes in from different angles, the rest of the body gets a low dose, fairly insignificant, this 25 gray usually is of no consequence, but just showing you how far away the radiation goes 
from the actual targets. This is a similar view, that, uh, this is a similar treatment, um, it's just showing the front view. Uh, so you, this is as if you're looking straight on from the front of someone, uh, and this is the right leg and left leg. Um, and you can see how widespread this 50 gray, which is the prescription, goes to all of these targets. On the right side, you'll have two pictures of what brachytherapy does. Uh, so this is the, uh, the cylinder inside the vagina, and you can see that the full dose of 24 gray is really given to a small area, as opposed to this, the full dose is given to a very big area. And then the half of the dose goes to a very small area. You see the bladder gets just a portion of the dose, the rectum just gets a portion of the dose, whereas in this situation, the bladder and rectum pretty much get the full dose. So it really depends on where we're worried about the cancer coming back and which treatment we would recommend. Usually it's one or the other. In some situations, we actually recommend both. And again, here you see the difference uh, in the radiation dose. It's a very small amount of radiation going to this full dose versus a very generous amount here. Okay. So before we actually deliver the radiation, we do something called a simulation, which is a mapping session for the radiation. Essentially, everyone gets a CAT scan uh, that is going to get radiation treatment. Uh, we use some kind of immobilization device to make sure the patients aren't moving during the treatment. Um, this is a typical immobilization device for uh, a woman when we're treating her pelvis. You can see there's uh, this blue cradle. It's molded for each patient. So we make that to help keep the leg stabilized, which means the hips aren't moving. Um, we draw, uh, so once we get this CAT scan, we actually draw on it. Uh, we have to tell the computer where the target is. Here is the cervix in this case. Um, you know, we wouldn't really, you can essentially say this is the vaginal cuff. Uh, so we would draw in the vaginal cuff. We tell the computer where the bladder, the rectum, and the femoral head, uh, femoral bones are, so that the, uh, the, the treatment can try to minimize dose to the, those structures while try to focus the radiation on the actual target. So we do this slice by slice on every step of the CAT scan, and then the entire treatment is based on this CAT scan. So it's really important that the patients are mobilized and that we're able to get the patients in the same position every day for treatments because the targets are uh, drawn in and the targets are set. Just so you understand how the patients flow through the radiation department, uh, the patients are typically diagnosed by a gynecologist with having endometrial cancer. They then have surgery as a matter of by the radiation. Uh, uh, oncologist at that time. And then if the patient needs radiation, then we do the simulation within a week or so. Some of this delay is due to insurance clearance. Um, so we, we, we um, do the simulation, which is that CAT scan mapping session. And then depending on the complexity of the situation, it may, we may need anywhere from one to 10 days for radiation planning. This is essentially a lot of calculations that are involved uh, using that CAT scan that I just mentioned. And then the radiation treatment course is anywhere from three to five weeks, you know, three weeks if it's brachytherapy versus more like five weeks of external beam. And then I typically see patients for five years uh, afterwards. And after five years, we at that point usually designate the patient being cancer free and then they don't need to see us further. So I usually uh, am in you know, have a fairly good relationship with my patients because I see them fairly regularly during this treatment process and then every, you know, several you know, every few months after treatment's done for about five years. So when I meet patients at consultation, I kind of jokingly tell them that I'm going to be friends with them for about, you know, five years, and then we're calling it quits. Um, I still see some patients beyond five years just because they want to be seen um, and just to, you know, have a little bit more peace of mind. But uh, typically, it's about a five-year, um, uh, I guess, relationship or commitment uh, to, to come in. Uh, now I wanted to get into the side effects of radiation treatment. Um, I'm first going to go through the external beam side effects. Um, acute side effects, this, this means radi uh, side effects patients may experience during or shortly after the external beam radiotherapy. Uh, patients can get diarrhea or rectal bleeding. They can get urinary frequency or urgency. Urgency is the sensation that you have to go all the time uh, and may not be able to hold it. Some people can get pain or bleeding with urination. Uh, this, Skin over uh, the pelvis can uh, start to crack and peel. Uh, patients can get nauseous and vomit, and then they can have fatigue. 
Medications can be given to manage most of these symptoms. Unfortunately, there's nothing that we can give for fatigue, um, but these other ones are usually managed uh, with over-the-counter medications if they need any medications at all. And these side effects typically resolve two to four weeks after treatment. So the side effects of uh, external beam radiation can be chronic, meaning they either start or last more than three months after the external beam. Some patients have persistent diarrhea and rectal bleeding. This is, uh, I would say these chronic side effects are quite rare, but they, they, they can happen. Um, patients who have diarrhea or rectal bleeding uh, in the chronic setting are patients who may have had some predisposing conditions such as colitis uh, prior to the radiation treatment, um, urinary frequency or urgency. This uh, you know, can be seen after radiation treatment. We rarely see urine or stool leakage after radiation treatment. Bowel obstruction or perforation, uh, extremely rare. Patients who have leg edema are the ones that typically they would have leg edema after the surgery first, and then the radiation can make it worse. Uh, patients can get pelvic bone fractures. Um, these are usually patients don't even notice they have bone fractures. It's they get a CAT scan and then sometimes they're uh, the sacrum, which is kind of the butt bone, can sometimes show some fractures and the patient's like, oh, I didn't even know it, but it's just something that sometimes the radiation can weaken that bone. It's rare to have significant chronic side effects. Very few of my patients will actually go on to have these, but it is possible. And then medications or minor procedures may be needed to treat these. Going on to the potential side effects of cylinder brachytherapy. Um, acute, again, these are the ones that can occur during the treatment course or shortly after. Um, diarrhea, dysuria, it means pain on urination or a little bit of burning, kind of like a urinary tract infection. And then fatigue. These side effects rarely require medications to treat. My patients will just tell me, yeah, oh, I had a little bit of diarrhea the other day, no big deal. It went away the next day. So you don't even take medications for it. And then these side effects typically resolve within 24 hours of each procedure. Possible side, uh, the long-term side effects of brachytherapy, people can get vaginal dryness, vaginal fibrosis or shortening. We give our patients dilators to prevent some of the shortening and fibrosis. Um, and we also recommend using some lubrication uh, if you're sexually active for the dryness. Patients can get uthral strictures, uh, which means it's hard to initiate urination because there's scar tissue in the urethra from the radiation. Um, patients can get urine or stool leakage. And then I, I haven't seen this, but it is reported in the literature where there's a fistula, which is an opening between the vagina and the bladder of vagina and the rectum. Um, the side effects may affect sexual function and may make public exams with the doctors uncomfortable. So they actually did, uh, there was a large internet, uh, European study that was done where they compared brachytherapy versus external beam radiation um, for intermediate risk patients. This was when people were routinely doing external beam uh, for patients and people were starting to say, can we just do brachytherapy? So the study was done in the early 2000s and it was published in uh, a major uh, journal, Lancet Oncology, or Lancet in 2010. Um, and uh, what they found was that the cure rates for intermediate risk patients were the same if they did brachytherapy or external beam, but they found that brachytherapy had fewer side effects. So because they had similar cure rates, um, but the brachy had less side effects, brachytherapy became has become the favored treatment in intermediate risk patients. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, similar cure rates, less long-term, uh, the, the side effect in particular that was improved was bowel toxicity, meaning diarrhea uh, and stool leakage. Um, there was slightly less long-term bladder issues with brachytherapy, but not a significant amount of improvement. Uh, so the main reason people have shifted towards brachytherapy versus external beam is because of fewer GI toxicities from the brachytherapy. They found no difference in sexual function or overall quality of life. That was uh, an update from this study. Uh, they kind of analyzed the sexual function and the quality of life in these patients and reported it in a radiation oncology journal in 2015 and really found no difference in sexual function. I put an asterisk there because I've been treating patients, you know, for over 10 years with these treatments. And I do find that brachytherapy affects sexual function more than external beam. When I examine patients after external beam, I feel like I can't even tell they had radiation. Whereas when I see 
uh, patients after brachytherapy, there is a little bit of scarring at the top of the vagina and that may affect sexual function. So in my mind, I think there is a little bit decreased sexual functioning with brachytherapy over external beam. But uh, as I mentioned, the external beam has been shown to have more GI toxicity. Um, so it's, you know, we want to balance discussion with your physicians uh, if you fit into this category. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to mention that surgery is, without a doubt, the first step in the treatment of endometrial cancer. Post-surgical treatment depends on risk factors. Patients who have low risk factors uh, do not need any further treatment. Patients who have intermediate risk factors, we may recommend radiation in those. You know, there's, even amongst those intermediate risks, there are, is a spectrum, uh, and some patients may not even need radiation with, amongst that intermediate risk. The high-risk patients will almost always get chemotherapy and possibly with radiation. Radiation treatment can be done either with brachytherapy or external both, and in certain cases we may, uh, I'm sorry, brachytherapy or external beam or possibly both. Typically for intermediate risk patients, we recommend brachytherapy, and for high risk patients, we recommend external beam uh, because it treats a bigger area, um, and then possibly with brachytherapy. Uh, on the whole, radiation is typically well tolerated, but there are some possible long-term side effects. The radiation has been sh uh, shown to prevent recurrences, but has not been shown to improve survival as chemotherapy has. Um, and then whether or not you need radiation treatment uh, warrants a balanced discussion with your doctors about the pros and cons. And that's it for my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. This was very interesting. And we're going to start the Q&A. Um, you can still submit questions in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try to get through all the submitted questions, but we may not be able to uh, due to time constraints. Um, so the first question, Dr. Gupta, you had mentioned that um, radiation could be done at different points in somebody's treatment, either be, uh, before or after chemo. Um, what do you think, is there an order that is better? Is it better to have it bef uh, before, after? So that's a great question. Um, to be honest, uh, no one knows the right answer. Um, I have been to national meetings and they have spoken for an hour about this topic, the timing of radiation and chemo. They have done different studies uh, to try to uh, uh, answer these and they really aren't conclusive. Um, I can tell you at Mount Sinai, we typically do the chemotherapy first. Um, as I mentioned, the, these patients are the ones that have high risk disease. And the thing that may be most life-threatening is distant metastases. And chemotherapy is the best thing at controlling those. So we have a tendency to give chemotherapy first and then do the radiation after. Um, I know there are some institutions, there are some situations where the patients uh, are given chemotherapy and radiation together. Um, and this can be a situation where the surgeon uh, is a little bit worried about the results from surgery and they leave a positive margin, which means there may be some cancer cells really left of the vaginal cuff. And if, we, if we're really concerned with that, maybe we would go more aggressively um, and, and treat the radiation earlier because radiation is better at controlling the disease in the pelvis, whereas chemotherapy works better through in the rest of the body. So the bias at Mount Sinai is to do chemotherapy first and then radiation, but there's certainly evidence for doing the radiation first and then chemo or doing them together. And, and how long do you have to wait after surgery to start um, the chemo and then the radiation if it's yep. in that order? So the chemo is usually started about four weeks or so after surgery. Um, and then we typically wait for patients to recover from chemo, again, about a month uh, to, to start the radiation. Uh, in those intermediate risk patients who uh, don't need chemo and are just getting radiation, um, we wait again about four to six weeks. Um, the vaginal cuff needs to be healed if we're giving brachytherapy. So it may actually be closer to eight weeks after surgery that we start the brachytherapy, if that's it. Um, somebody wrote and asked about lymphedema. Um, can radiation therapy cause lymphedema? So brachytherapy does not cause lymphedema. Um, the external beam can. Um, it's rarely seen these days. It used to be, uh, back in the day, they used to do much more extensive lymph node dissections, uh, and those 
big lymph node surgeries was what caused some lymphedema in these patients even before they had radiation. And then they would get radiation and that would cause even more lymphedema. But since the surgeons aren't doing as aggressive surgeries anymore, we rarely see lymphedema from the surgery. And then again, it's usually not seen after radiation either. Okay, here's somebody who wrote, what are the options if brachytherapy fails and there is recurrence in the vaginal cuff? So I have not seen that. Um, I was actually speaking to one of my colleagues today and we were, we were talking, I've probably treated hundreds of patients with vaginal brachytherapy and have not seen a patient recur. There is evidence that it still could. Uh, so, um, you know, it's still a possibility. Unfortunately, the treatment options are pretty difficult. We could still give external beam radiation. However, if we were to give such high doses, there may be some potential for serious complications. It's also a conversation with uh, the surgeon to see if there's a surgical possibility, but it, the surgical options may be uh, quite limited uh, and maybe really extensive. So that requires, a, it's a very unique situation. Uh, as I said, I haven't seen that in my uh, you know, over 10 year career. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody asked an interesting question um, here about that. You mentioned that you bring patients back for follow-up uh, for up to five years. And they were wondering, are patients still having issues? And we're kind of just wondering about that timetable and, and yeah. the length of it. So the reason for the five years of follow-up is for twofold. One is to, you know, make sure that the cancer isn't coming back, make sure we aren't seeing any s suspicious changes when we do our pelvic exams. So the, the most important thing is to make sure the cancer hasn't come back. So that's the, one of the reasons we do the exams. But the other reason we see the patient for five years is just that to manage some of these uh, long-term side effects that may arise. Majority of the patients I see for follow-up, you know, when they're four years out, five years out, they're very quick visits. Um, just you know, asking patients if they're having any new side effects. Um, I mentioned there are some chronic side effects that don't appear until two years after the radiation treatment or three years after. You know, once in a rare while, I have a patient say, oh, I'm starting to have some blood in my stool. Is that from the radiation? And it potentially could be. And then so I would help make the refer referrals to gastroenterology if need be or things like that um, after first trying some conservative measures. So the purpose of those follow-ups is to both surveil for cat cancer and to manage the side effects if there are any. Thank you. Um, somebody asked, what do you suggest to reduce long-term scarring in the vagina from brachytherapy? So the dilator is something that we give. Uh, the peak scarring uh, from the brachytherapy occurs about six to nine months after the last brachytherapy treatment. So we typically tell patients to start using the dilator after the, you know, right after treatment's done or a couple weeks within the treatment being done and using it for at least a year. Um, and if either they use the dilator or if they're sexually active, uh, either will work to prevent that scarring. Um, and as I mentioned, the peak scarring happens about six to nine months after treatment. And then when I'm seeing patients about a year out, we'll reassess the scarring. If they're still having some scarring, I'll tell them to continue using the dilator or you know, maintain sexual activity. Um, but, uh, you know, and then we'll continually reassess how long the dilator needs to be used for. But I typically have patients use it for at least a year. They've done studies, they've had some intent, uh, uh, was just our radiation oncology uh, field had our national meeting uh, just a couple weeks ago, and obviously it was virtual, um, and in one of the sessions there was one of the, uh, there was a nurse practitioner who uh, was dedicated to trying to improve sexual functioning in patients who have undergone brachytherapy, and she uh, started up an intense educational program for her patients and did a study and compared her intervention versus patients that didn't get intervention and found, unfortunately, didn't find much difference because what the problem is, uh, you know, we, it's just really hard to enforce people using the dilators at home. Uh, as much as we try to reinforce it, she said she found about maybe, I think, six months after treatment, 10% of the patients were compliant with using the dilator. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a very tricky subject and uh, uh, certainly under addressed. Um, and uh, this is a constant conversation that I try to engage my patients, but for obvious reasons, uh, not everyone feels comfortable talking about it. And actually on that same topic of the impact on, on sexual activity, um, once you've had the discussion with your patients and um, and talk to them about, about different options. Are there other um, medical professionals or people that they can see if they're still ongoing issues yep. to kind of complement what you're 
you know, what your advice you're giving them? Yeah, so I, um, you know, there, every institution is different in the services they provide. At Sinai, we do have uh, a team that can help with, uh, you know, counseling. We can help with, you know, if there's an anatomical change, we do have uh, gynecologic surgeons who can help do minor procedures to help, uh, you know, restore the function uh, of the, you know, vagina and for sex. Uh, so that's something that we will refer our patients to occasionally. Um, and then also there's sexual counselors that can help, you know, because there's a lot of fear, I think, after surgery and radiation and potentially chemo to really, you know, resume sexual activity. So I think there's a, an emotional component as well as uh, a functional component is the anatomical changes, uh, change, you know, as there are. Okay. Um, so I would certainly bring it, if, if there's a question, I would certainly talk to the radiation doctors, I would talk to the gynecologist, the gynecological oncologist, if they have anyone in their institution who specializes in these types of uh, procedures that can help repair uh, any damage that was done, um, or even, like I said, the emotional counseling. Okay, thank you. Um, this is actually a patient who had a total, had serious uterine cancer, a total hysterectomy, and also radiation. Um, is it true that her chance of recurrence, um, and this may be hard, I know this is a somewhat in, uh, individualized question, but mm -hmm. um, that her chance of recurrence um, has gone significantly down now that she's two years out from diagnosis? Yeah, so usually the two-year window is crucial in these cancers. If an endometrial cancer recurs, it's typically within the first two years, not always. Um, and so once patients cross that two-year mark, it's kind of a huge landmark for us because we rarely see the cancer come back after that point. We still can see some, so it's definitely important that they continue to follow up with their physicians. And this is, again, why I see patients for about five years, because we, we, we occasionally do see patients beyond that two-year mark, two mark, but the two-year mark is, is a huge landmark. Okay, great. Um, this is actually an interesting question also. Uh, somebody who had brachytherapy and wondered uh, why it was so unpleasant and noisy. Um, is that <laughs> something that's just part of the of the way the way it is um yeah so i i would say you know even though from the physician standpoint we think that brachytherapy is much much easier because it's only a few treatments uh over three weeks whereas the external radiation is you know 25 treatments or so over five weeks uh, i think patients are less excited about brachytherapy because <laughs> we put a device into the vagina um, and sometimes during the consultation i'll show the patients the, the cylinder so they have a better idea of what it looks like and they I think it looks like a medieval torture device and they're like well i can't believe this is what you <laughs> treatment um but uh it actually you know most patients during the actual treatment don't have much pain um the, the tube is inside you know the cylinder is there and as i mentioned there are different sizes and so we try to work with the patients to figure out which size works best for them we do recommend using the busy, biggest cylinder size that can fit um, comfortably, um, and that's a little bit uh, tricky because we find that the radiation is most effective and causes the least scarring in the long run. So sometimes we will try to use a slightly bigger one, um, but uh, you know th that's why this patient may have felt uh, to be a little bit uncomfortable, but usually patients don't actually feel the radiation working. It doesn't feel like it's burning or anything like that during the actual treatment. The treatment itself takes about five minutes with brachytherapy, five to 10 minutes, and so usually the patients say they feel the tube there, um, the radiation machine usually doesn't cause, I, I don't feel like it causes that, there's not many noises. There are some um, sensors that are on just to make sure that everyone's aware that there's radiation uh, going on in that machine. So I'm not sure if that's what that patient is talking about. The sensor is kind of beeping. Um, the machine itself isn't really giving off that much noise. And some people say they can feel the vibration of the radiation going through the cylinder, but it's, it's usually a pretty seamless procedure and a lot of my patients actually fall asleep and when I stop you know tell them the treatment's done they like, I'm waking them up because they're snoring <laughs> <laughs> during the treatment so it's pretty so I've actually had one patient say oh you're already done I didn't even know you started um, and so it's, it's usually pretty well tolerated uh, so um, uh, you know I'm not sure this patient specific experience and like I said that maybe the larger tube was used because they were kind of borderline between sizes and they were trying right. to use the larger one Okay, and actually, there's a few more questions about vaginal scarring. Um, somebody asked, how can you, 
how can somebody tell if there's vaginal scarring? Is that something only an internal exam can ascertain? Or are there specific symptoms the patient experiences? That's a great question. Yeah, so most people who have vaginal scarring have no idea that it's there. Uh, they'll walk around, go about their daily routines, they won't know it's there. Um, if they're, you know, if they're sexually active, it may feel uncomfortable uh, if there's significant scarring there, or they may have some bleeding after sexual activity because um, that area is a little bit fragile. And so if there's, you know, the trauma from sex, uh, it may cause a little bit of bleeding. So that would be the only way. And then similarly, if you're going to your doctor and you have pelvic exams, they may be more uncomfortable because of the scarring or may cause some bleeding. I have had some patients saying, uh, and this is mostly like right after treatment, they'll say that they were moving boxes or lifting something heavy and they started to have some spotting after that. Again, that could be partly from the scarring, uh, but for the most part, people do not know they have vaginal scarring if it's there. It's usually something the physicians know. Okay, thank you. And actually, I did have one more generalized question here, um, which might be interesting for the audience. Um, you spoke about increased estrogen due to obesity, um, but what about increased estrogen due to taking hormones? Exactly. So that's the other thing. And so most women, uh, most uh, pills these days, hormone replacement therapy, have some element of progesterone in there to combat the uh, estrogen working by itself. Oh, so okay. as long as you have the interplay between estrogen and progesterone, it usually is not a major risk factor. It's just unopposed estrogen is, is the problem. And so the okay. progesterone has to, yeah. And then I, I, somebody asked, what is a vaginal cuff boost? Yep. So that is when uh, the patients are getting both external beam and brachytherapy, we say we're giving a boost or an extra dose of radiation to the vaginal cuff. That's usually kind of when we're saying we're, someone's going to get both types of radiation treatment. They get external beam to the pelvis and they get a vaginal cuff boost with the cylinder. So a little bit extra dose uh, to, to the vaginal cuff. So there, there's particular situations where we would do both treatments. Oh, okay. Um, I think we're going to let me just make sure. Um, somebody uh, did ask also about their level of GY, um, that they had 2100 GY, yep. and why would that be so high? Yep. So, um, so I can just scroll back to my slides here. So GY is gray, and um, it's, someone got essentially 21 gray or 2100 centigrade, it's just how you use the measurements, it's like grams versus milligrams, um, it, they just added zeros to make it centigrade. So that patient got 21 gray or 2100 centigrade, same thing. Oh, That's okay. Typical, yeah. Okay, um, I think on that note, uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to end the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. Uh, great, thank you for really inviting me, it was a great, uh, I left my email address up uh, on that last slide, uh, if people want to, you know, feel free to um, email with any questions. Uh, again, it's hard to answer specific patient questions about your specific situation, but uh, if there are any general questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's very nice of you, thank you. And I wanted to thank everyone else for participating and submitting questions. And please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. It will take a minute to download when you exit the webinar. And, yes, great. Um, Thank you for the questions there. It's great to have everyone involved and uh, hopefully I answered their questions uh, appropriately. Yeah, those were really interesting questions and, and we really appreciate all the, all the responses and thank you again. And um, have a great, have a great uh, rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Take care.